All right, uh, we are ready to begin. We are in First John. Uh, we got a little bit into chapter two um, because apparently I'm taking this at a snail's pace for some reason. Uh, but we're in First John chapter two this morning, and uh, we'll see how far we get. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Our blessed Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you for all that you do for us. We are thankful to you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. We pray that we will always walk in Him, that we will always strive to love one another in imitation of your love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, I guess probably the best thing to do, uh, we're going to pick up in verse 3, with the reading, anyway. We're going to read from verse 3 down to verse 11. And then, uh, we talked about some of this last time, but we'll talk about more of it now. It says, By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. All right. Now, again, as we noted, we have a series of contrasts here between the guy who says and the guy who actually does the thing he says. Uh, So, you know, verse 4, the one who says this. Uh, Verse 6, the one who says. Uh, Verse 9, the one who says. There's an interruption in these contrasts in verses 7 and 8 by this uh, old and new commandment. and Exactly which one it is we'll talk about. This is the big difference between the person who says, I know God, and the person who actually knows God, is whether or not they are doing what he says. Keeping his commandments, keeping his word, abiding in him, walking in the same manner that he did, being in the light. And, as John uh, continues to sum all these things up, the concept of loving your brother is key to understanding all of this. Uh, A person who is not loving their brother is not, by definition, not keeping the commandments, not doing the will of God, uh, and vice versa. You cannot do just one of these things. You cannot know God and not love one another. You cannot walk in the footsteps of Jesus and not love one another. You cannot keep the commandments and not love one another. You cannot say you are an obedient Christian who walks in the light if you do not love your brethren. And vice versa. You really can't say if you love your brethren unless, well, you're actually making an effort to understand what God has revealed and trying to keep God's word and keeping the commandments. Our relationships with one another are connected with our ability to understand this difference between one who says... And one who does. And if all we do is talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk, and we don't really care what God has done for us, we don't care about our relationship with Christ, and we're not really capable, consequently, of caring about our relationships with one another either. Because the true love for others involves a desire to make them grow in Christ. Alright, so, you know, he talks about this, you know, somebody could say, I've come to know him, but they're not keeping his commandments. Well, that's obviously not true. They haven't come to know him at all. They're lying. They're making things up. But, verse 5, whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. What does that mean, that the love of God has been perfected? What are we talking about there? (laughs) Okay, perfection. All the time. It usually, you know, completed, matured, perfected, you know, I mean, that's the idea. Um, But perhaps a better question would be, you know, I I think the real struggle here is not, what do we mean by perfected, but what do we mean by the love of God? Are we talking about God's love for us, or are we talking about our, or are we talking about our love for God? Which one is it? Hmm? Yeah. Okay, and and this raises... It raises kind of an interesting question, you know, can God, how is God's love for us perfected? 
Huh? Okay. Right. You know, I mean, so there's this kind of this thought question, you know, if God's love for us is somehow, you know, imperfect, that's probably not the right way to think about it. More along the lines of, you know, that God had this work he was trying to accomplish this, uh, and once he accomplished it, once he completes it, shall we say, you might argue, well, the love of God has been perfected. But, you know, it's not until it talks about in verse 5, you know, whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has been perfected. And so that's kind of an interesting concept to think about, that a response for us is somehow needed to complete God's love. Yes, Mark. Okay. Uh, since we're made in the image of God, especially as Christians, we're made in the image of God, then what we do reflects upon God, directly upon God. Okay. And uh, that's we don't love one another, it reflects to the world a deficiency in God's love. It's not, it's not that God's love is in actually, but it's the perception of God's love. Hmm. It's not like any kind of sense. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, it kind of... I guess turning it around in my head, and I, I thought it was kind of an, it was kind of an interesting thing to uh, think about. You know, I was reading somebody, and you know, they they just kind of dismissed out of hand the idea that it was God's love for us. You know, that's God's love could never be imperfect, so how could it be perfected in us? But I got to thinking about it, and you know, one passage that came to mind, and it's not an idea that's talked about a lot in the scriptures. Understand? Uh, and the other passage that talks about it is equally difficult in Colossians chapter one and verse twenty four. Where Paul makes a comment, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And you read that, you go, wait a second, what was lacking in Christ's afflictions? What kind of uh, idea is that? You know, Well, there's a sense in which, uh, there is some sense in which, even though Christ's perfect work is accomplished on the cross, he says, it is finished, it is done, it is completed, there is another sense in which that work is still being done, still being manifested, if you will, in the lives of Christians and in the love that they demonstrate for one another, which is why Jesus tells them, John thirteen thirty four, this is a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's why he tells his disciples, after he says he's going to the cross, he tells them that if you want to be my disciple, what do you do? Take up your cross and follow me. You deny yourself, you take up your cross, and you follow me. The Christian life is lived in imitation of God's love. And in that sense, we might argue, well, you know, we see the love of God being perfected. And of course, then there's the flip side of it too. It is our love for God that is also being worked out, worked towards to completion and perfection. And you think about it, have we ever loved God in the fullest possible capacity? As much as we possibly can? Well, you know, there's always a little bit more you can do. Have we ever completely banished our fear with perfect love? You know, you read a little bit further. In fact, uh, this idea in uh, 1 John chapter 4, in verse 12, John writes that no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. 1 John 4 and verse 12 And again, in verses 17 and 18 of that same chapter, by this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Well, I mean, can anybody say that they've completely banished all fear? You know, well, I mean... I mean, fear seems to you know be constantly intruding on people, you know, uh, even just a little bit here and there. And so there's this that what we have here is a situation where we have an ideal to strive for rather than an attained reality. You know, no one can genuinely say my love has for God has been completely perfected, but you know that is nonetheless something to strive for. Whoever keeps His word in Him, the love of God has truly been perfected. Uh, you know, anyone who proudly claims to have perfect love, well, they'll show by their very claim itself that they've not understood 
don't understand the nature of Christian love and what Christ is trying to do for us. How do we show the love for God? Hmm? In us. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and I mean, our our love for God is demonstrated in our love for other people. That's. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's the claim that John's going to make several times throughout this book. You know, you get chapter 4 and verse 20, for instance. He says that if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, well, he's a liar. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, here we go. we got this world... It's trapped in darkness, a very selfish, self-centered, unloving, whatever, you know, the realm of darkness in this world. The world looks at us, we sees light. But how is that light manifested? How do men see, what, how, how can people tell what the light is? How do people know that we're disciples of Jesus? Hmm? But how? Our behavior. Our behavior. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if what? If you love one another, John 13, verse 35. That's what Jesus said. You know, it's the thing that separates us. It's the thing that distinguishes us. It's the thing that you know, people can... I mean, you know, there's so many... You know, I mean, you fill in the blank. By this, all men will know you are my disciples. There's a lot of stuff that brethren would put in that blank that Jesus didn't put in that blank when he said it. You know, what he said was, if you have love for one another, which raises... You know, the important point, you know, the, contra- the logical contrapositive, if men do not know that you are my disciples, maybe you don't have love for one another like you should. And they're in li- that, that, that's the great challenge, and that's the bit where, you know, it's like, why can't people, you get churches everywhere, they say, oh, why can't people figure out, well, this, is where the, this is where the truth is, this is where God is. Well, maybe because you're not doing what Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35. That's a hint right there. No. You, you have something? <laughs> And to admit, when, you know, That's true. You know, you, I mean, you come, you come in, in Matthew five. Jesus say in Matthew 5, you're sitting at the altar, you're offering your sacrifice, you remember your brother has something against you. Which is more important? Finish up your worship, finish up your sacrifice, go through the, you know, well, I got, I'm worshiping the Lord, I'm following his instructions. No, Jesus said, you leave your offering, you go be reconciled to your brother, and then you come back and offer your sacrifice. You know? And what would that look like? If churches, it'd be like, hold on, wait a second, wait a second, we, we, we can't start the worship assembly this morning until I get it sorted out, this issue I've got with my brother over here. You know, what would, what would 
God's people look like if that was the kind of priority that they had? Can we have that kind of animosity toward one another and then come before the Lord and worship Him and expect it to be acceptable and pleasing in His sight? No. Of course not. That's the great challenge. You're not walking in the light. You're not doing His commandments if you do not love one another. Now we, we keep, as we keep reading through this text, by this, uh, the end, the verses 5 and 6, I do not like that verse division. By this we know that we are in Him, the one who says He abides in, the, in Him, ought Himself to walk in the same manner as He walked. And the reason for that trouble is, you know, with the verse division is because almost every time John says, by this, he's talking about what follows the statement, not what comes before it. Um, there, there's a couple of ambiguous places, but for the most part, all of the unambiguous examples we have, he's looking at what comes after. Uh, and we know that we are in him if what? If we act consistently with our claims. And the one who says he abides in him, is that a bad thing to say? I abide in Christ. Is that a bad thing to say? No, it's not a bad thing to say. But, you know, look at the rest of verse 6. If you say that, you better be doing it. You better be walking in the same manner that he walked. Um, you walk as Jesus walked. Follow his example. And what was his example? Well, look at the cross. Look at the way he treated other people. Look at the love that he had for one another. You know, I mean, he washes the feet of his disciples, and then he said, I did this for you as an example. You know, if I, you, you call me teacher, master, rabbi, if I being the teacher and rabbi did that to you, you should do it for one another. And the point isn't, you know, the ritual of foot washing. The point is the humility, the service, the unwillingness to, you know, to buy into the world's notion of a, some kind of a pecking order. You know, I mean, here Jesus is washing the feet of his disciples, which was just total cultural upset. And, but Jesus is like, I'm, this task isn't beneath me. It's not too good for me. This kind of service isn't beneath me as a person. It shouldn't be beneath you to do that for each other either. And then, uh, we kind of have this little interruption. I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. But which is it? Is it an old commandment or a new commandment? Come on, John, make up your mind. It's black and white. Say what you mean and mean what you say. <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess it, you know some of that depends on which Old Testament stories we're reading, of course, too. You know, I mean, like. I'm just saying as an overview. Right. Well, I, that's okay. Oh, well, my my impression, for instance, you know, you really when when you get to the book of Deuteronomy in particular, I mean, Deuteronomy just overflows with language about you know, love the Lord your God. What does the Lord require of you except to love? You know, to keep his commandments and all that. Uh, so there's quite a bit about that and an interest in the heart. I think we need to. Have, this is my my caution, I guess. You know, anytime, and this is just sort of my thinking. Well, I don't. That's not really my thinking, but uh, my my caution is that when we read the Old Testament, we want to be very careful to avoid the notion that you know it's all about just that God's only interested in specific outward rituals and mechanics, and He's not really interested in the people's hearts and possessing them. Which, I mean, you read Deuteronomy 6, what's the foremost commandment in the law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Now, I do think you're right about this. That when you... How do we put it? There's a difference between telling someone, you have to love of people, you have to love God, you have to love your neighbor as yourself, and actually demonstrating it. Christ demonstrates it. Yes. We 
Mm-hmm. Right. There's there's definitely a sense in which you know Jesus coming on the scene changes things in such a way. There's a there's a difference between being taught know the Lord, like Jeremiah thirty one says, and actually knowing the Lord. And that break happens. You know, between, okay, I'm reading this book that says that there's this God who loves me and that I should love Him in return, and actually seeing, oh wait, here's proof that God loves me in the cross. And, you know, there's something about that that sort of compels us towards action, or it should anyway. If not, maybe our hearts are too hard. <laughs> oh, Mark. Well, this is the old commandment, because all the way back to me, I tried to get Cain done. Cain was brother of Uh-huh. There's a very real sense. In what, I think I think we're getting you know to the idea here. You know, I mean, God's always commanded love for the brethren. Leviticus 19:18, "You shall love your neighbor as yourself." It's quoted so many times in the New Testament, but it is an Old Testament commandment. Uh, and Jesus, when he's with his disciples in John 13:34, he says, "A new commandment I give you, that you love one another." And like, well, Jesus, that's not new. God's been telling us that from the beginning. And well, as I have loved you, ah, so has the standard changed? Well. I mean, you could argue the standard was always implicit because we're to be holy as God is holy, we're to act as God acts, we're to love as God loves. Um, but there's, you know, and Jesus gives a new significance to it, certainly, in the cross. You know, and then, but then, again, like you said, we need to relearn it. Why do we relearn it? I mean, even us, even those of us who've been reading the Bible, we read it for our whole lives even, we come to, oh, love one another, yeah, yeah, I know, I'm supposed to do that, that's important, love for the brethren. Maybe we need to relearn it a little bit. There's a, there's a, it remains true and is continually being realized and actualized in the life of Jesus, the life of his followers. Yes? Let me bring this down now. My life. Okay. I became a Christian. Mm-hmm. That was why I was at that time. I was scared to tell. I was being an elder, a lover of good or a lover of Did I see your hand?
I mean, yeah, the Old Testament has a lot of, you know, well, here's not not to do it. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's certainly quite a bit of that in it. And, I mean, it, it, God has definitely communicated to us, you know, by a, you know, a very lengthy story to show here's how we got from point A to point B. And in every step along the way, here's, you know, here's how God has shown his love for his people and how his people have reciprocated, or in many cases not reciprocated, um, I mean, and the end result, of course, is God has been saying the same thing since the beginning. Uh, you know, Leviticus 19.18 is pretty old. I hadn't thought about, you know, Cain and Abel. Maybe I've had this pointed out to me before, actually, and I forgot about it. So thank you for reminding me of that earlier, Mark. But, but the Cain and Abel story is implicitly a reminder that, yes, you are supposed to love your brethren. You're not supposed to kill them like Cain did and be like Satan. Um, so you start you start reading that God has always had this in mind from the beginning. He demonstrates His love by humani- for humanity just by creating Him, just by you know wanting to dwell with Him, despite not really needing to do any of that. And man's response is well, not to demonstrate the same kind of love for one another, not to demonstrate the same kind of love for good, uh, but rather to redefine good and evil on His own terms and to start acting in cor- increasingly corrupt ways. And that's the story of the human race right there. And then God looks at all that. And you, know, you see so much in the Old Testament about what our sin deserves, and then you get to you know, the New Testament, and you see what our sin really deserves when Jesus comes, dies on the cross, and why does he do that? Because he loves us. And why do we love? Because he first loved us. Oh. So this is the... Um, this commandment, old because it's always existed. Old, because it existed even in the teaching of Jesus. And by the time John writes, you know, the gospel's been preached for a while, people have been becoming Christians for a while, Jesus' message has been preached for a while, so, you know, what was new in Christ, maybe just became a little bit older for the people that were hearing it. But on the other hand, John says, no, it needs to be new as well. The darkness passes away, the light shines brighter and brighter. Uh, now, you I mean, some argue, well, this is, you know, the dark, world in general is passing away and the darkness is fading in the world and Christ is shining more brightly. Uh, you know, that's a very popular interpretation among post-millennials who think the world's getting better and better and better. You know, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I tend to think everything's cyclical. Uh, you know, sometimes it's getting better, sometimes it's getting worse. I'm not really a big fan of, you know, trying to preach that one generation is just so inherently better than another. Um... But then you get to the more likely what we see. You know, Christians see things a little bit more clearly. You know, our individual experience. We grow in our faith. Our love for God grows. The darkness in our life starts passing away, and the selfishness that you know has corrupted us and you know made us against Christ starts to pass away. Our love for others grows. Our light in our lives grows. Our love for God grows. And of course, ultimately, we see the true light coming. It's the end of the world coming as well, when we will be with God, and, you know, when, uh, shall we say, that we no longer need the lamp shining in the dark place because the day has dawned and the morning star has risen in our hearts, as it says in Second Peter 1 and verse 19. When you start talking about this true light that is already shining, and then you start talking about walking in the light in the darkness. So we come full circle back to that idea again. What does it mean to walk in the light? Well, if you walk in the light, you, know, you love your brother. And if you say you're walking in the light and you hate your brother, well, then you're not really walking in the light, you're walking in the darkness. And if you hate your brother, well, verse 11, you're just flat out walking in the darkness. You don't know where you're going because the darkness has blinded you. But is it really also black and white? Life is just all one or all the other? When, you know, I'm only walking in the darkness when I've sunk to just total rock bottom? Or is it that I'm only walking in the light when I'm absolutely perfect? What's the either or quality that separates them? What separates a guy who walks in the light from a guy who walks in the darkness? Love. Now, it's kind of a, a shocking comment because 
you're just kind of like, well, you know, I mean, we might there might be people we don't love, but that doesn't mean we hate them. We're just indifferent about them, right? You know, I mean, it's like, you know, we might try to point out the fact, I read one writer, he said, we're trying to point out the fact there's a lot of people in this world, we meet them in daily life, and, you know, we can't really have a relationship of love with them because our contacts with them are so slight, so insignificant, you know, but... I mean, can we say we love our garbage man, for instance, or garbage collector? Well, we don't hate him, right? Well, but John, John's not going to have that. You know, you either care for the needs of others to the point of self-sacrifice, or no, you, if you don't love them, then, well, you hate them. Ah, ha-ha! But in here, here's, where brethren, here's the other place where brethren try to hedge their bets. When John says, the one who loves his brother, and he's talking about the one who hates his brother, ah-ha! Well, there's the bit that's going to get me off the hook. As long as I can say he's not a brother, I don't have to love him, right? Is that what John's saying here? Oh, <laughs> are we off the hook for loving other people? You know, there was another guy in human history who asked some kind of a similar question. Anybody know? No? Love your neighbor as yourself. What's the first question everybody asks? Who is my neighbor? You know? Who's my neighbor? The, the, well, you know, the Samaritan was a neighbor too. But Jesus kind of tells a parable, you know, about... And then at the end of it, it says, which one of these guys was a neighbor to the man who got attacked? Well, it was the Samaritan. Um, and it raises the question... You know, I tell, I, I tell a different version of the parable of the Good Samaritan because I feel like the, the phrase Good Samaritan in our culture is just... It, it, people don't get it. Uh, you know, Good Samaritan is equivalent with Good Deed Doer in today's nomenclature. So what you need to do is you need to find somebody who's just so repulsive in the way that Samaritans were repulsive to Jews and put them in the story instead. So I tell the parable of the good congressman. <laughs> and, you know, you go through the whole story and the congressman's the only guy that helps the guy who's injured. And I told that story and somebody came up to me after and said, well, that would never happen. And I go, now you know how they felt when they heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, because who is my neighbor? Well, it really raises that question. Um, you know, I, I, because at the end of the day, you know, I, I think sometimes too, love for one another, people, people, people will claim, oh, well, I love my brethren, but it's just kind of this plausible deniability thing. I may treat them like utter garbage and say nothing but nasty things to them, but it's really just for their edification and their admonishment anyway. I may completely ignore them, but I really secretly love them in my own heart of hearts and mind of minds here and there. It's, you're kind of like, do you? Really? <laughs> I'm, you know, the one who says versus the one who does. Is it the one who says he loves his brother versus the one who's actually demonstrated his love for his brethren in his life? Uh, well, we're back to that contrast again. And somebody can say they're walking in the light till, uh, till their face turns blue. Somebody can say they love their brethren until their face turns blue. You know, you'll never meet, I, I, you never pose a question to a church and say, all right, how many people here hate their brethren? Nobody's going to say yes to that. Of course not. They're all going to say, we love our brethren. But that's not the question. The question is not whether you can say that. The question is whether you do it. The question is whether I do it. And if we don't do it, then we walk in the darkness. Hmm? Ooh, well, there you know you can do nice things for people and not be sincere. Yeah, well, that happens too. Yeah, I mean, and in the end, well, I mean, who knows the real difference between those things? Well, ultimately, only God does, and it's not our place to act as judge and decide who is and is not being loving. It's our job to look at ourselves first of all and ask the question: Am I being that guy walking in the darkness and just? You know, is my Christianity a sham? You know, do I need to change the way I think about this? Do I need to see? Do I need to relearn? This new commandment, since I clearly didn't get it the first time. And, you know, we're being honest. You know, I think each and every one of us could say, well, yeah. You know, there's some way in which I could improve, in which I could, you know, grow in my love for people. Um, you know, I, because love is something that grows, too. That's the other side of it. Yes. Well... Mm. 
I mean, you know, we look at neighbor, and I mean, even you go back to Leviticus 19.18, even then people read, love your neighbor as yourself. And I mean, a very popular interpretation of that, even in Jesus' day, it seems, was, you know, neighbor means fellow Jew. The only problem is that if you read Leviticus, and I, I think this is proof that the Jews didn't even read Leviticus. Nobody reads Leviticus. Uh, but if you read Leviticus, and you read all the way to the end of chapter 19, where that commandment appears... You know, you get to verses 33 and 34. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall do not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So down in verses 33 and 34 of Leviticus 19, he makes a point. Uh, oh, by the way, if you thought love your neighbor as yourself only meant your fellow Israelites, no, I want you to love the alien and the stranger among you as yourself too. No getting off the hook. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 No, I mean we're clearly talking about you know our fellow man and things like that. Now, is there a difference between relationships that Christians have with one another and relationships that you know we the love that we have for outsiders? Is there a difference between the two? Yes. Why? Have fellowship with those that are walking in the light. Mm-hmm. Right. The relationship of love can only go to a certain point if it's not reciprocated. And I think that's the real point. Does God love everybody? Yes. But does everybody enjoy the same fellowship with God? No. And the reason why? Because not everybody returns God's love. You know, are we supposed to love everyone? Yes. But is everyone going to enjoy the same fellowship with us? No. Reason why? Because not everybody reciprocates that love. Because the world will hate you, Jesus said. And don't be surprised when it does. It hated me. If it hates Jesus, it's going to hate those who follow him as well. So there is a, a sort of reciprocity that needs to take place, you know, for the relationship to really advance. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I mean, the, the, the thing I think we also need to remember is, you know, the, the capacity that love has to grow. I mean, you know, tell a story. All right, so, so sometimes people say this, and actually somebody said this to me after, said this to us after Jenna and I got married, you know, that, oh, well, you don't really love your, you don't really love each other right now. And... You know, because you just don't understand what love is yet. You've got to wait for it to grow. I disagree with that way of talking about it. I've heard people talk about it that way before. You know, I mean, it's like, do mar- people who stay married for 20 years and have a functional marriage love each other more then than they did back then? Hmm? Well, you'd hope so, yeah. Yeah, they look back and they reflect, wow, we love each other so much now. Why we didn't really love each other at all back then? Well, that's not true. I mean, you can love them as much as you can. What's happened, you know, it's like, well, I was only giving 30% at the beginning, and now I'm choosing to give 100%. Well, that's not what happened. What happened is, you know, your capacity for love has probably grown over time. Uh, and that's probably a better way to think about it. Um, and that's the way it is with God, too. You know, I mean, our love for God is going to grow as we mature, as the commandment becomes fresher to us, and uh, as we relearn it, so to speak. Uh, this commandment's always existed, but... You know, we continue to grow. We can grow in our understanding of what it really means to love one another. Really root ourselves down to the idea of what the cross means and the the, the depth of self sacrifice that Jesus went to and that we can go to. We start understanding. You know, okay, our capacity for love for one another and for God will grow over time. All right. Hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Ouais. I'm, I'm sorry? Perfection. Well, I mean, yeah, perfection, again... Right, yeah. And as we noted before, perfection is something that we... It's an ideal to strive for rather than a goal we're necessarily going to attain in this life. In this life, we're not going to reach perfection. It's not going to happen. But does that mean we just go, oh, can't do a thing about it. Just got to be satisfied with the bare minimum and all that. Well, no, of course not. You know, you continue to work at it. It's like anything else in life. You know, you'll never be perfect at something, but you can always improve, always make it better. And how much more important is that in our relationship with God? And our love for God? And then we get to... In the five minutes we have remaining. All right, um, verses 12 through 17. Hmm. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men... Because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. All right. Uh, Now verses 15 through... Verse 15 is like one of the... Verses 15 and 16 are like one of the most quoted uh, things. You know, you get the famous three-point sermon about the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life. Um, but this other bit here, uh, this I am writing, I am writing, I am writing, I've written, I've written, I've written, uh, that, that's kind of a, a super odd passage. And if you, you, know, you crack open any two commentaries at random, they will not agree with one another on how to interpret it. Because it's just like, what, what's he getting at here? Um, and so... So I ask the question, why does John write this letter? Why is John writing? Well, mm-hmm. All right. Reaching forward, okay. Okay. Right. Set your mind on things above. That's a Colossians 3 idea there. Yeah. I am writing. I have written all that. Focusing on all things. Little children, fathers, children, uh, young men, so on. Mm-hmm. He's trying to name. You know, in, case, in case somebody thinks, oh, he's not talking to me. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now, this is kind of an interesting bit, you know. I mean, because I mean, there's several questions that arise when people read this. You know, first of all, I mean, well, here's here's what we can tell. There's three groups that are being addressed, and he addresses each one of them twice. I'm writing to you, little children. He writes to you, fathers, and he writes to young men, you know, young ones or young men. Or, um, so, you know, this raises the question: Does the second set merely just repeat the first? Is there a difference? Is there a difference between I am writing and I have written, which I didn't used to think that, and now I'm kind of think there is, but I'll explain, I'll explain that next time because we're out of time. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then, of course, you know, who are these groups of people in the first place? Uh, and I guess here's kind of the thing that got my wheels turning and was pointed out to me, uh, the difference between I am writing and I have written, that kind of temporal shift. You know, normally I would be like, yeah, we shouldn't make a big deal out of the little grammatical quirks like that. But there is another place in 1 John that we've already read where he kind of shifts from talking about the past to talking about the present and tries to get us to think about it both ways. Anybody can remember what it is. That's what we will talk about next time because we're out of time. Thank you all for your attention.